You're listening to a City on a Hill podcast. We'd love you to use and share this podcast, but please refrain from editing the content without permission from City on a Hill. If you'd like to know more about our church, or if you'd like to donate to the work of City on a Hill, please visit cityonahill.com.au. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold! The people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How are we doing, City on a Hill? Good. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Use it now by your Spirit that we'd be a people that would marvel at your glory, your supremacy, your sovereignty. Help us to see, help us to know, help us to trust, help us to obey, help us to love you. Be at work, we pray, for our good, for your glory, in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said with one super loud voice. Amen. Amen. So it's Boxing Day 2018. Uh, Vanessa and I pile our four kids into the people mover, ready uh, for a family road trip for our holiday in Sydney. It's about 5 a.m. The kids are tucked into the back. I've got a fresh cup of coffee and we are making good time. And as we head out on this road trip, I'm just imagining this dream adventure 
I see our family singing songs together. I see my, hear my kids you know, laughing at all my bad jokes. I see my wife riding shotgun, sitting next to me with a hand on my knee, and I see myself just breaking free from the busyness of life and enjoying this long road of freedom. And we start out, head out of the driveway, down a few streets, and within about 15 minutes, I hear, Dad, I need to go to the toilet. So we pull over for the first toilet stop. 15 minutes later, Dad, I need to go to the toilet as well. And so we pull over again. Within 90 minutes of our road trip, I've already made four toilet stops. Then I have to navigate three tantrums from the back seat as kids fight over who gets the comfy pillow. And then I personally manage to hit not one, but two kangaroos. 15 minutes down the road, boom, back tire blows out and we are on the side of the road. Good news, it's Boxing Day, so all the shops are closed and no mechanic can be found. This is before Wangaratta, right? So we haven't even traveled two hours, and here we are on the side of the road having a very live debate about what we should do next, right? We've got a flat tire, the kids are screaming, there's dead kangaroos on the road, maybe we should just pack up and go home. Right? Who's, has ever, ever, anyone ever found themselves in that place? Anyone had that family road trip just go horribly wrong? Today, you know, we begin this epic series in the book of Exodus. Exodus, of course, the second book in the Bible, but at its heart, it, it is a story about a journey, a journey. It is, if you like, a family road trip that echoes all the way back to Abraham and a promise that God made to him that he would establish a great nation, a great people, a great family, and he would lead them to the, the land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where they would be with their God and God would be with his people. And yet what we discover, <coughs> excuse me, on this road trip is that things don't go to plan. Uh, The road to freedom, the road to the promised land is long, it's hard, it comes with many unexpected twists and hits, and it's a journey that is going to test them at every corner and in every way. How do God's people respond? Well, let's find out. You've got a Bible handy. Please come with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to explore today's opening chapter in three parts. Act 1, Joseph is dead. Joseph is dead. Beginning in verse 1, the writer says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. All right, so the story of Exodus begins with the list of the sons of Israel. And at first glance, this is historical, but a closer look will realize that this is actually theological. Right? Interestingly, the book of Exodus doesn't begin with the word these or the. In Hebrew, it begins with the word and. And these are the sons of Israel, which is helping us see that what we have in Exodus is a bridge between all that has come before. Exodus is not a standalone story, it's the continuation of God's story that begins in the first book of the Bible. And and why is it that the sons of Israel are in Egypt? Well, of course, it centers on the story of a young man named Joseph. Uh, Joseph was the the favorite son of Jacob and the envy of his brothers. Um, In a fit of jealousy, Joseph's brothers throw him into the bottom of a pit and sell him off as a slave. And yet, in the hand of God, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, he's rescued out of that pit where he's raised up to serve as the prince of Egypt. And Egypt serves Joseph and his family well, but it was far from the final destination. In the period of Exodus, which many would say is about 1,500 years before Christ, Egypt is a superpower in the world. It's both uh, revered and it is feared. 
They have a huge uh, military arm, uh, established a kingdom like no other. Just think of the pyramids for a moment. Pyramid of Gaza, which was built by hand, stood some 50 stories high. Right? It's huge. And these, these living monuments were, 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 were both a show of dominance to all the other nations, but actually a, a monument to their kings and queens, known to them and us as the pharaohs. Right? They, they were an honour to the pharaohs, who was the most important, most uh, powerful person in the entire kingdom, right? They were, they were worshipped, in fact, as a god, a human, yes, but at the same time, a divine force that Egyptian people would worship. All of which to say that Israel uh, is not only in a foreign land, they are dwelling in a pagan and polytheistic culture uh, that, that is vastly different, at odds with Israel and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what makes Joseph's reign in Egypt quite remarkable. He was able to negotiate a rare pardon uh, that allowed the sons of Israel to move in and establish a home. But of course, what we learn in the opening chapter is that the days of Joseph are now over. Right? So look to verse 6, then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew, grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. Right? So, Joseph is no longer mediating for his people. Joseph is dead. And with this changing of parliament and the rise of a new king, so emerges a menacing threat to the people of Israel. This leads to Act 2, the king rules. Verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Right, so, so there's been a change of government and we're told that the new Pharaoh doesn't know Joseph. Now, this could mean that he's ignorant of his own political history or that he is choosing to act in ignorance. Either way, it doesn't take this king long to turn his scepter against the sons of Israel, right? So, standing before his great empire, the Pharaoh declares that the people of Israel have increased in number and are now a threat to their national security. Does the Pharaoh actually believe this to be true? I doubt it, but like all dictators, the Pharaoh knows that in stoking people's fear, he can then justify the oppression he's about to unleash. Therefore, they set taskmasters over the people of Israel to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. Right? So, so, with the spirits crushed, the Israelites are unable to rebel, and as an added benefit, Pharaoh and his tyranny would lead them to establish the construction of these two great cities. Uh, the first, which was dedicated to a pagan god, the second of which served as one of the residencies for the Pharaoh himself. Of course, the, the, the lust for power and control is rarely satisfied, and so as the story goes on, they are, uh, Israel is um, inflicted with more and more suffering and oppression until finally, verse 12, the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service, service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves." You see, once you're marked with the Pharaoh's seal, you belong to him and you can be used and abused in accordance with his will. Whatever he wants, he gets. And what we see here is that taskmasters were appointed to, to dominate and control the sons of Israel. And you can see throughout history that these guys were armed with sticks and clubs and would beat you into submission. Any act of defiance would come with more pain, more oppression. 
If you defied their leadership, you would be locked up and thrown down a well. And did you notice what is fueling the Pharaoh's oppression? Look again to verse 9, he says, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. For those familiar with the Bible and the covenant that God made with Abraham, you'll notice that it's central to that promise, that covenant, was that God's people would multiply, that He would give a great nation of descendants to Abraham, so vast they would fill the land like the the star, stars fill the sky. And not only that, He was going to gift them with their own land. They wouldn't be living in a foreign land, they'd have their own land where they could serve and worship their God. And yet, what are the two things that Pharaoh is going after? Their multiplication, their growth, and indeed their escape. What does that tell you? It tells us that Pharaoh is opposed to the very thing God is determined to do. Think about that. Pharaoh here represents not only a force against Israel, but a force against God Himself. Last week, I took my son, he's 11 years old, his name's Zach, I took him to the movies and uh, I said, Zach, you can, you can choose one of two movies. Here they are, Peter Rabbit or Godzilla vs. Kong. <laughs> Which do you suppose he chose? <laughs> right? I don't know if you've seen it, 103 minutes of special effects, poor acting, thumping bass as Kong and Godzilla, these two towering titans go head to head. Now, Kong, as you can see there, is a uh, tough but noble figure who is there to save the world, while Godzilla, with his particularly small head and very bad bad breath, uh, is an almost unstoppable force for evil and destruction. Who wins? You'll have to waste 103 minutes of your life to find out. (laughs) But as ridiculous as this may sound, the battle of Kong versus Godzilla, the eternal struggle of light and darkness, order and chaos, which, by the way, runs through every movie, every story, every told, stems ultimately from the battle that exists between good and evil, right? The book of Exodus is more than one nation's struggle for survival, it's the unfolding battle between the two great kingdoms in this world. Think about it, Pharaoh is a real character, a real person, a real ruler who is responsible for his own wickedness and oppression. And yet, as Christians, we know that our battle is not ultimately against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of this dark world, right? So, in the modern age, we don't tend to talk a lot about the dark world, we don't tend to talk a lot about the devil at all, right? It was C.S. Lewis who said that Christians are prone to two equal but opposite errors. One is excessive and unhealthy interest in the demonic, the other is to disbelieve in their existence. As Baudelaire famously said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. But the devil is real. The Bible says he's a deceiver, an accuser, a a, a lion, a roaring lion who prowls around looking for someone to devour and destroy. He's there uh, in the Garden of Eden, deceiving Eve and destroying Adam. He's there in Egypt, enslaving God's people and inflicting oppression and hurt and destruction and death. He's there in Gethsemane, trying to draw Jesus out, and He's there at work in our world today, blinding eyes, hardening hearts, enslaving people to darkness and to death. You know, when we talk about slavery, most of us assume we're talking about something that existed a long time ago, but slavery didn't end in the 19th century. Today, there are more slaves in the world than ever before. UNICEF estimates there are over 21 million victims of human trafficking. This includes 5.5 million children. 70% of all victims are women and young girls, and more than 50% who are trafficked are sexually exploited. 
right? These are not merely statistics on a page, but real people with real lives pushed and pulled by the hand of darkness. And then there are far more subtle forms of slavery. You know, each day I come into work, into the city, I walk past a, a TAB, and on the outside it's, it's run down, it's gritty, but inside you can see the flickering lights of the machine stacked upon each other, these flickering lights that draw people in. Do you know that in Australia we are the pokey capital of the world? There are more pokey machines per capita in Australia than anywhere else across this planet. And it's, it's staggering, it's shocking, it's confronting to realize that those who make these machines, those that are behind these machines, deliberately use techniques and lights and sounds and colors to ensure that when you're playing these machines, dopamine in your head is triggered. Why? So that you'd be hooked, so you'd be drawn in, so that you'd be stuck before that machine. You know, in Australia, we not only burn $24 billion every year, but as a result, are seeing a rapid rise in mental illness, homelessness, family violence, and in some instances, suicide. So what is that? It's modern-day slavery. It's the hand of darkness. Some of us may not have experienced physical slavery or financial slavery, but I'm sure everyone understands spiritual slavery. I remember hearing an interview with a Canadian rapper, Drake, Uh, incredibly gifted and successful artist who's won something like four Grammys, award-winning records, all that. And yet, listen to him describe in this interview his own struggle, his own slavery of the flesh. He says this, There was a point where I felt like I needed to keep the company of a different woman every night. I was trying to fill a void, but in the 15 15 or so seconds after sex, I'd know it wasn't working. That 15 or 20 seconds is the realest moment a man will have in his life. The next day, I'd convince myself to do it again, but during that time, I knew it wasn't working. You see, it doesn't matter who you are or what you have, we're all captured and controlled by something or someone. We could be a slave to our own bodies, a slave to sex. We could be a slave to money and possessions. The things that you own end up owning you. It could be that you're a slave to your appearance and the approval and acceptance of others. It could be that you're a slave to success, that constant need to be busy, that constant need to achieve. It could be that you're a slave to religion. The the religious treadmill has you constantly working for your own morality, your own self-righteousness. As Bob Dylan famously sung, you may be an ambassador to England or France, you may like to gamble, you might like to dance, you may be the heavyweight champion of the world, you may be a socialite with a strong, a long string of pearls, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Throughout the book of Exodus, I want you to be asking, Who am I serving? What has captured me? Who or what is controlling me? To know freedom, you must first know who or what is holding you. If that is not the Lord, then this is the time to get real with your life. It's a time to be honest with yourself. It's a time to see God and know who God truly is, right? Because in the opening chapter of Exodus, the devil looms large, and in fact, God appears silent. And yet, what we're going to discover throughout this journey is that God is supreme, God is sovereign over all. He is never pushed around by evil. He never submits to evil. And He never gives up on His people. He never gives up on His plan, and He never gives up on His promise. And this leads to the third and final act, the cry of freedom. Look with me to verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah and the other Puah, 
when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Right, so here we meet two Hebrew women. Their names, Shitfa, which means beautiful one, and Pua, which means splendid one. Now, these women served in Egypt as Hebrew midwives. Um, in our modern-day con- uh, context, they're probably head nurses overseeing a team, a great number of midwives. And yet, on account of the Pharaoh, these women are ordered to take the life of every newborn son. And notice the language here. The king is not just killing boys, he's killing sons, which is a reminder to us that this we're talking about the children of of Israel, the sons of God. And who's standing in the gap? A few Hebrew midwives. Let's not forget who the Pharaoh is. He's the most important, most significant, most powerful man in the kingdom. What he says, he gets. And let's also not forget that he is a cruel and capricious king. He has no hesitation in unleashing his fury. If you defy this man, he will tear you limb from limb, and he'll do it slowly, and he will do it publicly. And so, what do you do? Put yourself in the shoes of these two Hebrew midwives. Suppose you were asked by him, if you were ordered, what would you do? Verse 17, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. In the Garden of Eden, we read that the serpent came first to Eve. He came twisting God's Word and plunging them into death. The story of Exodus, in many ways, is a mirror to the creation story. However, in Exodus, the women don't swallow the lie nor fall in sin. Unlike Eve, they make a stand. They stand against the Pharaoh, and in so doing, they stand for life. This week, I uh, was reading the incredible, uh, remarkable story, true story, of a woman named Melissa Odom. Uh, Weighing just two pounds, 14 ounces, Melissa lay hooked up to wires and tubes in the neonatal unit on August 29, 1977. But there was no parent in sight, uh, no mother holding her little hand, willing her to live. Uh, Melissa's mother had already left the hospital, believing the saline solution, which she'd been given over the past five days, had aborted Melissa's life. However, the procedure failed. Baby Melissa was not dead, she was alive. Twenty years later, Melissa goes searching for answers. She discovers that her mother had not wanted her life to end, but that she'd been pressured by her mother, right? Melissa's biological grandmother had ordered her death, and to make matters worse, uh, Her grandmother was an educational nurse at the same hospital and served as a supervisor in her abortion. When the abortion failed, she instructed the other nurses, and I quote, to leave the baby in the room to die. How did Melissa survive such a traumatic, lethal situation? Melissa discovers that there was a nurse... (laughs) who heard her weak cries and gasped for breath and decided to take the baby herself. She defied the orders of her supervisor and rushed baby Melissa to intensive care. It's stories like this that remind us of the value of life and our responsibility as God's people. Like the nurse in Melissa's story, like the midwives in the story of Exodus, we are each called to make a stand. We stand against injustice. We stand against oppression. We stand against darkness and death because we are the people of life. In Jesus, we see God 
pouring out his life of Christ in the face of injustice. In Jesus, we see the sinless one dying in the place of the sinner. In Jesus, we see the one who conquers sin and death and in so doing, securing for us all freedom and life. And so, as the people of Jesus who know this victory over sin and the freedom we have in Him, we now stand with Him. In love, we stand against any and all forms of oppression and darkness and injustice and death. Now, this stand may be required of you in the family, you know, where family members are suspicious of your faith, hostile to your faith. You may be required to stand. This may be required in your workplace. Sometimes we can find ourselves working in an environment where we're encouraged, we're demanded to lie, to cheat, to steal. You may be required to stand. This stand may be required of you in your university, that you find yourself believing in God in a context where the worldview is leagues apart from what you know of the God of the Bible. Wherever you are, we are called to trust God and live for Him alone. And for us at City on a Hill, this means not only saying no to evil, but fighting for what is good, right? We're to be a light in this world. You know, as a Christian across the years since I've been a Christian and now as a pastor, I, I've often wrestled with what is like central to who we are and our purpose in this world. And one of the things I've noticed is that this constant live debate across different denominations and and different churches about how we are to engage this world. And it's almost like you've got one kind of stream, one side, where you have those who who say we should be far more active in the areas of social justice and the, the ministry of mercy, right? Caring for the poor, feeding the hungry, advocating for refugees, championing the rights of the oppressed. On the other side, you have those who are very wary of these endeavors, believing that social justice and and ministry of mercy are a distraction from our main purpose, which is what? They will say, it's mission. It's not about feeding the poor and giving, you know, uh, serving the homeless. It's about declaring God's Word and saving souls. So, which is it? Are we to be about mission or are we to be about mercy? I believe the answer is yes. We are a people of mission and mercy, a people who declare God's love and display God's love. You see, the book of Exodus shows us, listen, that God stands against oppression in any and all forms, whether that's social oppression, physical oppression, racial oppression, or spiritual oppression, wherever there is oppression, we are to enter into that darkness and shine light. This is why we as a church have as our first priority to pioneer mercy and mission. It's not either or, it's both and. It's a life marked by conviction, but also compassion. Last week, when we officially launched Reimagine, it was such an encouraging time. And, and I particularly uh, remember Wes sharing his heart for this city and some troubling statistics, right? Poverty rate in Melbourne is approximately 1 in 10 people. Domestic violence is approximately 80,000 cases a year. Problem gambling, 30,000 cases a year. 43.3% of prisoners released uh, from return to jail within two years. 67% of young Victorians report drinking at levels that put them at risk of injury. One in 20 Victorians use cocaine in the last year. One in eight people aged 16 to 25 in Victoria are experiencing high intensity loneliness. And of course, when it comes to church invol- involvement, the city is seeing record lows. What do we do with that? How are we to respond? Do we sit on the sidelines? Do we sit on our hands believing that the forces of darkness are too great? No. We choose to fear God and not the forces of evil. Like the women in Exodus, we make a stand. We stand against injustice and we stand for life. And what does God do? In response 
to these women, these brave women who trusted Him, who feared Him? Look to verse 20. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families. How did God respond to their obedience? He honoured them. He blessed them. Notice the gift here of families. Not, that's not just a blessing for them. That's a declaration that the promise of God is going forward. That no matter the force of evil, God's promise is secure. Notice the honouring of these women with the, the names, right? Their names are recorded in the Bible. That's significant. You know that throughout the book of Exodus, we're never told the name of the pharaohs, which is quite ironic because the pharaohs go to great length to be remembered, to be known, to be worshipped, to be seen. And yet here in the Bible, they're not recorded, but these two Hebrew midwives are. And look at how God uses these women, right? In many ways, these women are unnoticed and unexpected. They don't hold positions of power or prominence or platform, yet in the hand of God, they are turning this kingdom upside down. Think about it. Without these women, you don't have Moses. And if you don't have Moses, guess what? You don't have the Exodus. <laughs> and if you don't have the Exodus, you don't have David. And if you don't have David, you don't have Mary and Joseph. And you don't, right? God, it, God takes a hold of their obedience, their faith, unexpected, insignificant in the eyes of the world, and yet used powerfully, extraordinarily by God. Think about this. So often when we think about making a difference, we think about position, power, and platform. The truth is, if you want to make a difference in this world, it's not about position, platform, and power. It's about obedience to God. If you want to make a difference, it's about trusting Him, fearing Him, obeying Him. In the big moments, yes, but also in the small and the everyday. One of the things you may notice throughout the Scripture is that God has a habit of using very ordinary people to do extraordinary things right? We see it with these Hebrew midwives. We're going to see it with Moses, right? When God uses Moses, he's, he's got a stutter and he's old and he's somewhat rejected in a foreign land. And yet God uses him as the mouthpiece to challenge Pharaoh, right? And then we think about King David. Where does King David start? He was the overlooked small son of a large family. Dad didn't even see him. God chooses him. You think about Esther, the people of Israel are oppressed once more by a pagan king. Who does God choose to raise up? A young woman. And then think of your own Savior. <laughs> think of Jesus. The one Isaiah said that there was nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. From Bethlehem, the son of a carpenter, hung out with the wrong kinds of people. No one expected that. No one saw that coming. And I can tell you that when Jesus was handed over to Roman authorities and pinned to that Roman cross, no one expected what God would do next. Look at the very final verse in our reading. The Pharaoh says this, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile. The Pharaoh turns the Nile into this place of death, right? Sea of chaos. And yet, in the hand of God, this sea of chaos, this place of death, serves as the very means of God's life and salvation, right? Out of the Nile, God rescues His people. Through the waters, they are set free. Think about this. In the same way, God takes the tomb of Jesus the very place marked for destruction and death, and uses it as our place of life, freedom, and salvation. Because like Israel, we who are in Christ are set free from the destruction of this world. Like Israel, we are set free from the slavery of darkness and sin. And like Israel, we who are in Christ are rescued to God 
to live for Him, to know Him. The book of Exodus is ultimately about Jesus. It's ultimately about His life and His love. And if you're here and you're not yet a believer, I'm, I'm so thankful you're here. It's been encouraging to hear testimonies of people the last few weeks who are giving their life to Jesus. It's no accident you're here. You're made for Jesus. You're made for His life and His purpose. If you're here and you are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus, my encouragement is to take a hold of that life, take a hold of that purpose. Like the midwives in this story, we should fear God and live for Him alone. And that means pushing back the forces of darkness in our world and shining the light of Christ. I know in this room there are some of you who are you are gripped by the issues of human trafficking. For you, that's not just statistics on a page. They're real stories and you want to make a difference. Some of us are, are gripped by the issues of homelessness. When you walk through these streets, you can't be indifferent. You see it and it grieves you. God's placed a burden on your heart to care, to serve, to love, to think about creative solutions. Some of you here today... Man, you love community, you love relationships, you love people, and so it breaks your heart when you hear about the epidemic of loneliness in this city. God's given you a burden, a call to make a difference. Some of you have a desire to, to, to work in a, in a company and, and lead in a different kind of way, a countercultural way, you know, where the world is hungry for greed and, and lust and power, you feel a burden to, to work with integrity and honor and generosity and encouragement. Some of you have a call to, to lead a family, a family where children can get to know the love and the truth and the beauty of Christ. And indeed, all of us have that call, don't we, to share the good news of the gospel with those around us. The unbelieving mother or father, the friend, the neighbor, Wherever we are, whatever we see this week, there is no shortage of opportunity. We're to look to Jesus. We're to trust Jesus. We're to shine the light of Jesus. God delights in raising up the weak to bring down the strong. God delights in using the ordinary to achieve the extraordinary. God delights in entering dark places and shining His light. Let's go to Him now and ask for the strength that we need in Him. Father in heaven, thank You for Your goodness and Your grace. Fill us with Your Holy Spirit, that we would see You reigning supreme over all. Help us to be captured by Your supremacy and Your sovereignty. Help us to fear You and not fear man. Help us to live for you all these days that we have. Lord, across this room, there's desires, there's passions, there's gifts, there's opportunity. Would you move by your Spirit that we would be in step with your will, taking hold of your life and living the purpose you've called us to live. We can't do that in our own strength. We need you. So come now, Holy Spirit. Fill us that we may live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you'd like to know more about our church or if you'd like to donate to the work of City on a Hill, please visit cityonahill.com.au.